Hi. Hello, Yvonne here again, and I'm joined by my very special guest, Chris Wong. And we were talking, Chris, about Panto and how an extraordinary 25 years, a quarter of a century, uh, as director of music at the various Pantos. And we're talking particularly about the Marlowe uh, Theatre, and we're talking about your favourite Panto, which you were telling me was Aladdin. And we were running through some of the, uh, the favourite Aladdins that you had. Talk to me about some of those. Um, so the first time I did Aladdin, um, Aladdin was played by uh, Daniel McPherson from Neighbours. And uh, Wishy Washy was played by Paul Hendy, who later uh, became producer of the Pantos, along with his, uh, his wife, Emily. Um, and the Dane was played by Eric Potts. Uh, it was just a fantastic cast. The whole show was uh, so much fun. Um, I just really enjoyed it. Um, in those days, I had quite a large band. Um, How small was the big band? We were talking about this last time, about the small big band. <laughs> small band. So this wasn't a big band. It was a, a small orchestra. So that, that band had two people two keyboard players, um, three blowers, bass, drums, and myself on guitar. Um, uh, one of the blowers that year was uh, a chap called Paul Booth, who now, uh, he now works for uh, Steve Wingwood, and Paul only plays in the BBC big band, and, uh, in, and he's a, a jazz musician in his own right, a, a very accomplished one. He, he lives, uh, fairly locally, so it's great to have him. Um, so yeah, it was a really good team, really happy vibe. Uh, I, I just like I find the story more interesting. Some of the stories I don't play for Panto; they are what they are. <laughs> some, <laughs> some last time, didn't you? Did you like Mother Goose? That was the 2019 production. Uh, Mother Goose. Well, that was the first time we'd done it, um, and it was to celebrate primarily our Dane. Uh, who's now uh, actor Ben Roddy, he's a very fine actor. Uh, that was his 10th year uh, with us, so Mother Goose, and they'd done it the year before at one of their other venues, uh, or the year before that actually, uh, uh, for, for Damien, I forgot, I'm sorry Damien, I forgot your surname, it was his 10th year at that. It will sound good in the edit, don't worry. If I cough at an appropriate moment, don't be in room. I don't, they'll, they'll, they'll assume you've got the surname as well. It's all good stuff. Yeah. But it is interesting. And a lot of people watching around the world, we have a lot of American viewers and things like that, they don't understand the tradition of pantomime and, and men dressing up as women and uh, you had the dames and all that sort of stuff. Talk to us a little bit uh, about the history of pantomime. Having done it for 25 years, a quarter of a century, a bit of the history and explain, if you were to encapsulate what pantomime is and why it's so important to the British theatre. Um, tell us about that. Okay, so um, for me at the Marlowe, it's 25, 25 years as musical director at the Marlowe. I've done other, other pantomimes as rank and farm musician before that. Uh, I think I'm on something like, I don't know, 32 pantomimes in total. Something like that, I can't remember exactly. Um, <clears throat> pantomime, yeah, it is a very British thing. The roots of it are in the comedy dell'arte with Harlequin and, and, and Scaramouche and so on. Uh, British panto, yeah, you have a, a dame, which is played by a guy. Uh, you have a principal boy and a principal girl. Uh, sometimes those are both played by girls. We've never done that though, uh, apart from one, which I'll come, I'll come to shortly. But um, <clears throat> they're traditional stories, uh, which are, of course now, since most of those stories have been taken over by Disney anyway, so the kids know the stories anyway, but they know the Disney versions. Um, lots of comedy, music, dance, um, comedy routines, uh, some pathos sometimes. Um, uh, traditional stories like Aladdin and, and Snow White, um, Jack and the Beanstalk, Mother Goose. Mother Goose, this year, was the first time we'd done it, so that made it uh, uh, more interesting to me, because all the others I've done, you know, three or four times. So doing a new title for us was 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 better. And because it was, as I say, it was Ben Rogers' 10th year, so they were celebrating that. So Mother Goose, the, the, obviously it's about Mother Goose, played by the Dane, 
guy, and uh, and he's basically in every scene. So it was a, a big celebration of his work. And of course, being my 25th year, they there was a celebration of my work. So I, uh, not for the first time, I flew playing the guitar. I had a very small role. I appeared in the ghost gag bench for the first time ever, having played it every year, having played it five, six times a show uh, every year. Um, I reckon um, I can work that out. That would be 13,500 times, Chris. That that's right. Played. Well, I've played that, played that tune, yeah. <laughs> and the ghost gag, for those who don't know, um, so there's some people on stage and they're talking to the audience and they're scared and they've heard there's ghosts and the ghosts come on in the background because they know they're there and they sing a song to, to, um, to cheer themselves up, basically. And then the, then the audience shouts, it's behind you, it's behind you. Because a lot of, I mean, Panto is about audience participation. They know the gags, most of them. They're old gags. Um, and they're often in every year. Um, but um, you boo the bad guy and you cheer the fairy um, and, uh, and you shout out. And there's traditional things to shout out and all that sort of thing. So the ghost gag is one of those routines. It's in every Panto. It's in every year. And it's the same every year. Although we try, at Canterbury, we tried to change it up. Paul has tried to change things up. So we've, we've had you know, ghost gags, we've had flying ghosts, we've had little ghosts, we've had spiders, we've had 3D projection, uh, all sorts of things. And this year, I, because it, I appeared just before that in a scene playing the guitar, doing Foxy Lady actually, but flying through the air. And, the, and then they made a thing about uh, uh, me being, it being 25 years and being on there and then I'm kicked off then I'm brought back on I'm rescued I'm captured by the baddie and then, I, and then I'm rescued by the goodies and we all run on and I got to sit on the ghost gag bench now the ghost gag bench in Canterbury is more famous than anybody um, it's so famous the, the ghost gag bench had a biog in the programme years before I got a biog in the programme um, and it's it's much much loved, and all through the year, you, you know, you hear people singing the song and, and saying the phrases from it, um, uh, which makes my hair fall out because I've played it so many times. But um, and even even at, even at Dave Lee's, the late and great legend that that was Dave Lee, even at his funeral, which was in Canterbury, that's how big a legend was. His funeral was in Canterbury Cathedral, with right. two thousand people, um, and the choir Canterbury. Uh, cathedral choir did the ghost gag routine so you know oh, really? angelic choir boys is that is that famous is that I, well known well i i went last year i went along we didn't have it this year but i went to the panto awards where you have the great and the good uh and it's at wimbledon theater and they all came right. along uh, and, and, and it was brilliant absolutely brilliant and it is and for those who don't understand the pantomime tradition it attracts some of the biggest stars will come on stage and take the lead roles as the dame, the men will dress up as the women, and the women will dress up as the lead characters, like uh, Dick Whittington and so on and so forth. And they become, it's a lot of people's introduction to theatre, and it's great, isn't it? It's a fantastic tradition. It is, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, for, for many people, it is their first experience of not just live theatre, but live music. Um, so the whole, it's something for the whole family. People, you know, you, people say, "Oh, it's for kids." But it's not just for kids. There's there's adult stuff in there hidden away, and adults love it just as much as as kids. Well, they, they do um, special versions for adults as well. I mean, Jim Davidson very famously did a sort of adult version. The Cindy he did, <clears throat> and the late great Dave Lee was involved in that. He was he was a, a regular sidekick to to uh, to Jim Davidson. Yeah, the the ruder ones we don't do those, but um, it's a it's a family show. Um, full of spectacle and you know marvelous costumes and so on it's very important very very important to british theater because for most theaters um it's a very large portion of their annual turnover and and, and therefore panto as well as being a thing in, in its own right it funds other let's say more cerebral work to happen without panto then you know, maybe new new productions, new plays wouldn't get put on and wouldn't be the funding for it. So it's it's more important than just oh, a tradition that we go every families go every Christmas. It pays for a lot of new art. It's really important and in many ways I think undervalued. Um, you mentioned the Panto Awards because this year I was nominated. No, I'm right too. You see, there's a subtle link here. That I thought I thought you were 
be modest, but I thought the Panto Awards. Come on, then tell us what you were nominated for. So I was nominated for Best Music. Quite right, too. Um, this year, uh, which is nice. Um, yeah, so the Panto is a very important thing uh, for, for British theatre. And like I say, it's most people's first introduction to theatre. It's their first introduction to a, hearing a live band and how different a live band is to recorded music and so on. I know, I, I loved it. I, mean, I As a kid, we used to always go, I lived on the, the seaside down there and near uh, Bracklesham Bays, my, where my mother still is. Uh, I used to go along to Bognor Regis and some of the great theatres down there. I think it was Leslie Crowther. I remember he, yeah. I think was, do you remember Leslie? And he was uh, one of the dames. And I remember the joy as a kid of being called up on stage because that whole audience participation is key to it, isn't it? It is, yeah, it's, it's really important. Um, and you can sometimes, you know, you, you, you know that someone from another country is in and you can, you can watch them and you can just see them foxed. The, 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 they're, they're suppo you're supposed to shout out, you're supposed to boo, you're supposed to say certain things. It, it, it's, quite, it's quite amusing sometimes. And another thing about uh, Canterbury Panto at Marlow is, is we always have, uh, there's always a large party every year they come from Reims. They travel over to come to Panto uh, every year because it's part of, it's become part of their town's culture now to come to our Panto. So yeah, really important. And obviously through doing Panto, I've you know, worked with many, many you know, celebrities and so on. One of them, of course, is Toya. So I first worked with Toya. Uh, we did a, uh, a summer production. It was in Belfast of Wizard of Oz. I was just the bass player on that one. And um, that's where I first met Toya. She was playing the Wicked Witch of the East, is it? I can't remember. Anyway, she, Toya is one of the, one of the best. The w was about. I don't know. <clears throat> I suppose the illustration would be the thing, yeah. but she Toya is known as one of was known as, as one of the best baddies. She's fantastic in Panto, and then a couple of years later um, we, at Canterbury we did Peter Pan, and, and Toya was Peter Pan. She's great, Peter Pan. She's got that kind of um, childlike persona and uh, mischievous nature that Peter Pan should have. Uh, a few years later, she was the Wicked Queen in Snow White, and then she was Carabos in Sleeping Beauty. And it was that year, 2004-2005 season, when uh, she came to me during the run and said, look, I've got a couple of gigs uh, for festivals. I don't have a band. She'd been busy doing a lot of theatre work, so she'd done the tour and West End production of Calamity Jane, for example. So she she didn't have a, a current band and um, that's when she asked me to, to put a band together and that's when I started working for her in 2005 and been with her ever since so um, I became her MD and guitarist and put bands together for her and yeah we've played ever since and, and some play some glorious plays so starting part of, and Toya is one of those brilliant all-round entertainers and she's yeah. Superb on stage. She's a superb actress. She's a prolific author. She does all these sort of wonderful things. And what I've loved in lockdown is the really creative videos that you as a band have been doing, but also Toya with Robert Fripp, her, her husband. And they've been uh -huh. doing some fantastic stuff, haven't they? They are nuts. Those videos are just nuts and 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 so funny. And and uh, they they broadcast them on a Sunday lunchtime. And, and they're just hilarious and just off the wall. And uh, they're just very short, but they're, they're just bright enough. Uh, you know, a minute or two of, of lunacy, basically, is fantastic. It's brilliant. I, I, for those who don't know, that I'm, that Robert is a legend in the music industry as well. And, and very rarely would come out or do interviews and stuff like that, because it's all about the music and you wouldn't normally. But he is, I mean, you, you just see a different side to him, which is wonderful to see, isn't it? Yeah, he, he's... He's a wonderful guy, um, you know, I, I'm honoured to call them friends. Um, uh, I, I'm the, the biggest, you know, the biggest honour is the second Humans album that Robert uh, joined us for. He joined the Humans for the album. So, uh, and that's just the, the, to me, you know, that's something I carry with me all the time. Um, amazing musician, 50 years ahead of his time. And, um, completely supportive of all of us not you know he's obviously supportive of his wife but he's supportive of 
on the rest of us as well. Um, and just, yeah, there's, you know, yes, he's, he's known, his music is, is, is highbrow, he's known as, but actually he's a very, you know, he's a funny, intelligent, very well-read guy. Um, and it's just, it's an honor, it's an honor to know them both. Oh, and he's, he's got, as, as you say, he's got this wonderful dry sense of humor, which, which I just love, you know, you work on that sort of basis. And you're right, the intelligence just oozes out of him, such talent. Yeah. Uh, but in such a, a, a reserved, sophisticated way. I mean, he, he, I mean, I'm saying he sort of dresses like an accountant, if you like, but there's not mm. this flamboyant sort of, uh, that sort of stuff. And he will basically look on stage and the whole music, the King Crimson, the sound of what happens there is just absolutely incredible with the three drum kits and so on and so forth. And I last saw them, I think, at the Royal Albert Hall, uh, which was absolutely sensational. Yeah, I, I also was there with Toya. Um, yeah, the, you know, the music is, you know, you have to kind of, you have to commit yourself to the, to the, to the concert when you go and just uh, allow yourself to become absorbed in it and it can be transportative if you allow that, you know, just forget your surroundings and just concentrate on music, it can take you to a completely different place, um, it's, it's, a, it's on a different level. And so influential, you know, and a lot of people in the UK maybe haven't, haven't heard very much, don't, you know, he's not a household name, but internationally, Robert, Robert and King Crimson are superstars. And you, and a, there's so many bands, like American bands, um, of all genres who cite Crimson as an influence. It may not be apparent in their music, but as, as musicians, they're such a huge influence. And really in this country, they don't have the recognition that they ought to have, I, I personally feel. Oh, no, and yet, you know, if you interview someone from the band Tool or something like that in America, they'll say, oh, the massive influence, biggest influence came from them. Um, and so, and, it is phenomenal. And, and as you say, co the collaborations they had, I mean, Robert's collaborated with David Bowie and, and things like that. I mean, talk about some of those collaborations. Um, yeah, so obviously Bowie was a, was a, a big one, an ongoing one, Eno. Um, there's, uh, there's an album with Robert and uh, Andy Summers. Um, and he's probably on things that you don't know he's on. Um, well, I know for a fact, well, I won't say who it is. It's, it's, it's uncredited, but he, so he's been in many musicians' lives, one way or another, but certainly one of the biggest influences of musicians. Um, you know, other countries honour him. So, yeah, so uh, in the early, early days of the humans, we played in Estonia and Robert came with us the second time. And he's, he's so important that the, that the, uh, the president came. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, in fact, the president came to the, the first tour when he wasn't there. But when he came to the, to the second time when Robert was there, we had dinner with the president. It's all, it's all through Robert and Toya. Well, a, that's what, actually, I mean, the, the humans, and what I love is, is this story about the humans and how they were set up, because originally the phone call was to get King Crimson in 2007, and it wasn't going to happen. So the humans, talk to us about that and how the humans... Uh, I think it was the fact that, the, the, I think the year before, Robert had done his soundscapes, uh, which is a very innovative way of making music. He'd done them in some churches, I think, in Estonia, and they asked him they wanted him to go back, and he couldn't go that year. So uh, I think Toya said, "Well, I'll I'll do something," um, <clears throat> and and she she'd collaborated with Bill, the late Bill Reefling, a bit, and and to do it live, she wanted me to come on board as well. So the humans was the three of us um, essentially. Um, we, we did that and decided we'd record it afterwards and carry on and write together more and so. Um, so yeah, it came about through Robert, uh, I suppose initially. But um, it's kind of thing in its own right, and we 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 write it back, obviously. And um, yeah, it was, it was, it was some great times there. Fantastic. My, my, one of my biggest memories of, of being in Estonia with Robert and uh, Bill and Toya is uh, is is stopping for afternoon tea and cake. Very important, you know, just to main some maintain some kind of you know, normal life. No, we'd stop with that afternoon tea and cake. It's a, it's a thing, and it's a lovely thing, you know. 
because you want it's not all about the work it's about the company you have because that influences and affects the work that you do the people you're with so and, and, and without that and you can see that on stage when you're, when you're on stage with Toya as, as in Toya Band when you're uh, doing the human side and when uh, Robert is, is, is with you you can see that I mean, it translates doesn't it that, that special bond well I think you know you, you know music unless you're a solo artist music is it's all about collaboration you know you're not, you're not on your own you're part of um, you're one cog in a, in a in a machine so and every cog is equally as important um, uh, so, you know, the relationships that you have off stage, do, you know, they they should show on stage, I think. So, I mean, you know, in my, mine and Toya's case, the, the relationship we have off stage, there's a lot of fun. There's, there's serious times, you know, the work needs to be done. You need to have serious discussions about things. But a lot of it is, with Toya and me, is the practical jokes. What, what sort of practical jokes do you have? Um, so she... <clears throat> so one pantomime, she um, is, or it's like it's, you start to fear going to work because you don't know what she's done. And so I'd go in and find that <clears throat> all the furniture in my dressing room had been removed, or I'd find uh, she'd got some some uh, fake snow and sprayed something on my mirrors, or I'd come out <clears throat> come out of the orchestra pit. And find all my civvies were missing. She, so while she's off, been off stage and I'm in the orchestra, she's stolen everything and hid them around the building. And and, uh, and in the toy band, I remember, uh, I think it was Manchester. I went to put on my my clothes for the gig and found that my sleeves had been sewn up. Okay, and I think that comes across on stage because she, we're uh, we're quite irreverent to each other on publicly on stage. You know, we we call each other names. Yeah. And all that sort of thing. It's all it's all in in love and, and jest, of course. But um, it, we have we have a lot of fun, and I hope that shows. Oh, it, it, de it definitely shows, and you can tell. I mean, as I say, what bands that stay together, and you've been together for a number of years. You can see it; it's palpable on stage, and and, and it's infectious. People love that mischievous sense of humour that that you all share. Yeah, and you know, mischievous mischievous is 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 a great word for Toya. It's a great, but you know, she's known, you know, by her fans as as, as Minx and stuff like that. But you know, it's like all these work, they totally apply. She's a Minx and she's uh, mischievous and, and fun, but she's also uh, both of them are wonderful, wonderful friends. I can't stress that enough. Um, there's a real care. Uh, we we the guys, you know, we're hired guns, but we really feel cared for. It's very important, um, and I suppose you know those of us who've been with her the longest, we wouldn't be with, we wouldn't still be doing it otherwise. Yeah. You know? I have to say they're one of the nicest couples in show business because it's yeah. such, a, such an artificial business, and so many people <laughs> you get. I, I, I discussed this with Toya earlier that you have so many people who are so full of themselves, and it's normally those who are insecure. And those who are, have a little splashing of a career and then disappear and go down again. And they're the ones who are pretty nasty sometimes, or they can be. Um, but the ones who are genuine and just be themselves and are comfortable in being themselves, <laughs> that, that's how it's sort of, you have that longevity and it makes a difference, doesn't it? It does. You know, and after all, we're all, we're all human beings. Um, you know, so being normal is important. So, you know, keeping your feet on the ground. I mean, I could, you know, describe how on one gig, it was a festival gig, so, you know, the festival's on for two days or whatever, so the dressing room that you got allocated that day was probably used earlier in the day by someone else. And Victoria's not averse to, to, to walking into this and think, well, this is a mess, and, and we'd, we'd all be setting up our gear and we'd come back and she'd clean the dressing room. She shouldn't have to. She sh absolutely shouldn't have to do that. But she, you know, she wants things to be nice for her and nice for us. So while we were busy sorting out our equipment, she's that's what she does. She shouldn't have to do that. And it annoys me when she has to do that. But that she would do that. Um, 
and, and very caring. And I think it does make a difference. And, and it, it shows, as I say, it shows with you as a band when you see the many performances. I've been to several gigs. I booked for in the band for several yeah. gigs as well. Uh, <laughs> it's been lots of fun. And you see it. I, I say that, that it's the same behind the scenes and behind the stage where you have that sort of mischievous sense of humour. Um, but And it then translates straight on to stage as well. Well, it just carries on. So she takes takes the piss out of me in the dressing room and we go on stage and she carries on taking the piss out of me. And I, her as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it works both ways and the, and the care is there both ways. All that, all that kind of the friendship and so on. Yeah. Um, it, it is, it's good. And you mentioned, I mean, the, the third person in, in Humans, uh, Bill Rieflin. Uh, who sadly died on March the 24th, just after lockdown in this extraordinary mm. time. Talk to me a bit about Bill. Uh, Bill was a, a, a wonderful guy, uh, dry humour again, uh, quirky humour sometimes. Um, interesting uh, with the music that he liked to, to listen to and study. A quite a, a again quite a broad knowledge across many genres um but an int he had a particular interest in sounds i don't mean sound from an engineering point of view um he once told me that what his favorite record as a kid was a a, a music a music concrete record of a, recordings in a, in a factory because he's just intrigued by the the interplay between the different machines and the combinations of rhythms that they made and it's just background noise really in a factory um so yeah music concrete he had an interest in he had a knowledge of all lots of styles of music and the history of it all and um and absolute uh taste so you know we we, we might be writing and it's like well should we go to this chord should we go to that chord and we would try every combination and there'd be a reason why we picked the chord change that we did um, because he said, "Well, that's that's more interesting to me. That you know, it's not just just well, it could be, it, you can write a call. I could write a call progressions all day long, and they'd be sound ordinary. But with Bill, it's like just picking exactly the right nuance in the chord progression that was was very important and, and made all the difference. And and then of course he he basically produced all of the records, so he would he would be there for the engineering, the mixing." Um, and so on. So, um, even whether you agreed with him or not in his choices, they were always interesting and very carefully thought out, and everything was done for a reason. Um, and then again, you know, spent time together writing and, and therefore staying with him in Seattle and, um, and get to know him and his late wife, Frankie. Um, he was a great artist painter um just wonderful times wonderful times interesting discussions about all kinds of things politics and, and music and art or, and everything or just observations on life you know and that's, and that's what the rest of us do all day long with our mates we may not dress it up in in in, in such clever language but so it's very human if you like um just as it is with Toya, you know what you know. Yes, there's a serious side, but even when we're being serious, it, it's still fun because it's it's friends talking about whatever you know and what our opinions are and listening to each other's opinions. And, and Bill's very much like that. Very much like that. And it it must have been very hard. I mean, it's um, it happened just just uh, just a few weeks ago in lockdown. Yeah. When you got the news, I mean, it was literally the day after we got locked down on the 23rd yeah. of March, we got locked down here on the 24th of March, that we heard the news that he'd passed. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I suppose I, I could say it wasn't unexpected, um, but um, Bill, you know, Bill had continued to work um, throughout uh, wanted to wanted to get projects done um, the the whole time. I hadn't seen him for a while. Um, the last time I'd seen him was with Crimson, which he then he then uh, had to to leave. 
the, on the last tour. He wasn't on the last tour that we that you and I both saw. Um, so yeah, it's all very sad. Um, and 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 can't you know we, we we on the inside we knew what was happening. So it wasn't unexpected, but it's still a shock when it when it occurs, when it finally occurs. Um, yeah, miss missing missing terribly really, because of the you know there you know there are there are things that he and I talked about that that I don't that where other people weren't there and that they're they're personal things between me and him as we as we all have there are personal things that I've talked about with Toya that I've not discussed with the rest of the rest of the guys we all have those relationships with everybody we know so you know those are moments are all very hold very very dear and um and through Bill met a lot of other interesting people as well um his, his sphere of influence is, is completely different to mine and much bigger of course so you know doing concerts in America with him you know other people other musicians um that I would look up to came to came to see us play and I met them and that's all interesting and and uh and stories to tell and and so on you know people that I've met just you know it's, it, what a life really a, a phenomenal life I mean talk to me about some of the bands I mean famously he was with REM and various others talk to me about some of the bands that he, he was with so Bill, yeah, R.E.M. So he he replaced the original drummer, who was also called Bill. It's easy, um, isn't it? I think I think in any band, if you find somebody who's just got the same name, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Where's the drummer? He's Bill. Uh, but you know, I think uh, you know uh, Bill and uh, particularly Peter Buck had been friends for a long time. So Bill, you know, grew up in the Seattle music scene. He he'd um, played in. Uh, some quite heavy bands there. He um, he played in a band called the Revolting Cox. I, I wonder if you'd say that. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to say it. it's a fantastic name for a band. Um, and um, yeah, just he, you know, he was a working musician who played in various projects, um, uh, and then and then in at the end of their career, he was with REM, I suppose. And, and the human. So I guess at that time he, he was limited to the amount of other stuff he could do because that would be a, a more of a full time thing. But yeah, in the eighties and so on, Ministry was another band he was in quite well known. Um, yeah, lots of things. Played guitar, played bass, played drums, obviously. And a whole collection of those sort of stuff. And talking about the records, I mean, it's, it's prolific is probably the best word to use because on both sides, with, with Toya and also with, uh, with, with Humans, you produce fantastic body of work. Talk to me about some of those. Um, so, yeah, with the Humans, it was three albums. Um, uh, with Toya, it's, it's the live work that we do. So both the, the band work and the acoustic shows. And of course, this year we also lost... Um, uh, the acoustic shows was a relatively recent thing, up close and personal, um, and I brought on board uh, a friend of mine who was living down in this area at that time, Colin Hines, who has also passed away this year, who was a, a fantastic guitarist and really great singer. Um, so initially it was just he and I, it was he and I and Toya, two guitars and voice, and that was really enjoyable because the music was very exposed, it could be much more organic. We could we could go off on tangents much more if something happened, or you know, you know, you may add a you know simple thing like oh oh it's an extra chorus, and you you can just go with it because there's just the two of you with Toya. Um, occasionally we'd have bass involved, and then uh, more recently uh, Colin became ill, and so we've had to do acoustic shows with say myself and Mike on bass and with John on on percussion cajon and so on and we've done we've done it just me and Andy so guitar and, and keyboards uh, so it's very flexible and each so every time it's, it's now different because there isn't an established lineup at the moment for for the first uh, two or three years of the acoustic shows it was me and Colin and it was great and there was a there was a kind of telepathic connection in terms of the music between me and Colin, I miss him very, very greatly. And, and I, he, I had the joy of, um, well, I, I booked you for the acoustic show, which I love. Yeah. I booked you for the Hippodrome in, in central central London, iconic venue. Um, that's right. 
and, and it, it was super. What I love about the acoustic show is that it is, it's up close and personal. We mix it with the stories and, uh, yeah. this little, and such a fabulous life uh, that Toya had. And seeing the three of you on stage again, the chemistry was just palpable, wasn't it? I think, yeah, I think I probably, in the acoustic show, um, I don't know if this is true, but I feel that like I smile a lot more in the acoustic show. Oh, you do, that's true. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure I mentioned that you do smile. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm kind of known for not smiling. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in the, up until about four years ago, I, I, was, I was known for not smiling. Um, when I was younger, I wore suits and ties, shirt and tie. I, I, even when I, when I went camping, <laughs> I, I was known in Cambridge as that guy who always wears a tie. Uh, all through university, I wore a shirt and tie, uh, my own choice. Um, that's not that's not ha doesn't happen anymore. But I was kind of known as being, you know, very serious. And uh, of course, I do smile on normal toy gigs and run around and have a, have a laugh and there's there's fun with my mates in the band and whatever banter toy toy gives. Um, but on the acoustic show, there was uh, because it was so exposed and you're so involved in what each other are doing. I don't know, I, I, I feel, as, you, as I say, I feel like I smile a lot more than you can say. And, it, and it's great to adapt in that sort of way, isn't it? I mean, we talk about ad adapting I mean, and for a smaller venue, and I, I booked you for big race courses as well. We, we went down to, to some of those where, uh, and, and um, you, you may recall there was one time when I booked you for a particular race course in Essex, where you got stuck on the motorway, and I was with Toya. I do, do you remember that time? And we were on the phone. And I was comparing as well, because we had Paul Young on the bill, and we had Rick Astley, and, and I booked Toya as well. And you're all there, and we were just we were trying to work out, so, shall we do this with backing track? Because the band is stuck on the road. Do you remember that occasion? Well, two, two of us were. So uh, myself and Andy, the keyboard player, who lives very close by, we usually travel together. And we'd got 15 miles from home and were stuck in a traffic jam, and we were there for hours. And, and uh, we really didn't know if we were going to make it. And in the end, we made it with 15 minutes to spare. So we literally arrived, shut the gear on the stage. Um, someone brought us a cup of tea. We set up, we played, we left. It was the quickest gig, but also the longest day. Um, I do remember it very, very well. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's an adaptability with what we do. Show must go on kind of thing. Um, are there favourite venues? I mean, another venue which, which I booked you for was the, the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, uh, which, yeah. which had a fantastic atmosphere, a lot smaller, obviously a lot thousands of people in, which we had for the, for the race course. But uh, the Royal Vauxhall Tavern is a few hundred people, but the atmosphere there is just one of the best audiences ever, isn't it? it? Yeah, it is. Um, it's, a, it's a special place, uh, the Vauxhall Tavern. I hope it survives. I, you know, it, that's the sort of place... That, that you know if they need help should get help because it's it's an important cultural venue very important so I, I, I hope they're doing okay I hope they're surviving um, yeah I, I'm I've played, played there twice now I think yeah that's right we, I, I, I did a double booking I got you two two bookings at the Vauxhall Town yeah. yeah. so, yeah. isn't it funny isn't it um, isn't it? Um, the other thing I'd say about about the acoustic shows is what it's shown. Um, you know, if you'd said to me ten years ago, take these classic toy songs. So I don't, and not necessarily the hits that everybody knows, but there are classic toy songs that the fans know. That are, if you'd said to me ten years ago that you, you're never about to do those in any other way than the way that they're done, um, I think it shows the quality of the writing that that we were, I was able to arrange them for two guitars. And they become completely different animals, um, uh, and and I, in my mind, I, I think think of a song like I R, which, as Toya says, when the band player makes the bricks bleed, and that really has no business working as a, as a two acoustic guitar thing. Um, uh, I'm quite proud of what I did with the arrangement arrangements for that, and and. And it's a test. It's a testament to the quality of the writing and, and, and the intricacies of the songwriting that they work in a completely different setting like that. Uh, that's something that's become uh, 
apparent to me through doing the acoustic shows is how much I actually really like music and how interesting the music is and what can we do with it? What, what can we achieve with different lineups with, with the same material? I mean, you're absolutely right. And the versatility, I'm doing it in different stages from thousands of people at a race course to whittling it down uh, to an acoustic set and whittling it down even further, which a lot of musicians have done now in these extraordinary times when we're just talking via whichever online platform we're using. So um, Toya very kindly uh, participated in something which I was presenting for uh, Lifeline Serbia and the NHS, which was an online mm -hmm. concert. And she whittled down, I want to break free, which is basically just her <laughs> singing to that sort yeah. of stuff. And it worked really well. And the good thing about it, it was involving with the Serbian royal family. And they asked me to present and bring some chums on and things like that. And Toya very generously, I did that. And it worked so well. And they, uh, as a result of that concert, and it was all publicized, I think they managed to raise £450,000 an online thing in this sort of whittled down version. So adapting in that way and talking about that body of work, which you can adapt, there are ways of making it work, aren't there? Well, it would seem so, yeah. Um, that you know, you you just have to have a, a mind, a mindset that will find a way somehow. You know, we, oh, that this has happened. We can't do that. So, what can we do instead? You know, rather than thinking, well, we were going to do this, and now we can't. That's the end of that. It's having an attitude of finding a way, and that's something I've learned over the last uh, four years through through working in other another industry. Um, having having that kind of mindset of, of how to make how to make things work um obviously i've had it in music as a musical director you you know in pantomime for example i might be trying to arrange uh a, you know a, a full orchestrated classical piece of music for for five people to play so you, how can you possibly do that so there, there are ways you learn how to do that you learn that you know if you apply yourself you can find a way to make things work uh, but through the through my other business interests i Obviously, I've, I've, it, that's all about uh, not being fixed in your mind about how you do something. It's like, well, look, actually, let's look at, is, is there a better way? Is there something else that we can say that makes that work or whatever? Um, so in this period where things have changed hugely, there, there has to, you have to find a way. And, you know, and we've all done online things which is not as simple as people think, because you can't just all get on a, Zoom, on, a, on, a, on a Zoom call or whatever and all play live together, because there's obviously time delays. These things have to be planned and organised. But if you have a mindset where, well, let's talk about it, how can, how can we do this? Rather than, well, we can't do that, then you can, you can achieve things, as, as, as many people have shown you. And you're absolutely right. And people, there's no way you can you can do it all live because obviously you can't synchronise it. There's a little bit of a delay and it doesn't work like that. So so the amount of work that goes into having you all on screen and doing that yeah. sort, of, sort of and and one of the things that um, that I've loved about these online concerts is it has all been paired back. So when Lady Gaga uh, did that and got lots of different people involved with various celebrities around the world, and we've done a number as well with with people involved. One of my favourites was actually seeing the Rolling Stones in their in their <laughs> individual rooms, and Charlie yeah. Watts banging. Well, it wasn't drums at all, but he was banging saucepans or something. It was just him. Yeah. I think. Yeah. But you also talk to me about your drum drumming career. Um, okay, I've always I've always loved drums. I you know, <clears throat> if you'd asked me when I was twelve what instrument did I want to play, it would have been drums and or bass, and. Uh, I became a bass player by by default, really. Um, um, so I, I I do as much work on bass as I do as I do on guitar, although I'm not as well known for it uh, out, outside of the local area, at least. I mean, there's people in the local area who have seen me play one instrument and don't realise I'm actually <laughs> actually do this bit. And and also drumming. Drumming, I've always had an interest in, and it wasn't until. Um, 2008 maybe that I that I then decided that I would have a proper serious go at it and, and got some equipment and um, got myself match fit so to speak and um, I, I really enjoy it so uh, in fact again sadly it came about because uh, the my, the drummer I had for Panto that year was the, the Panto was his last job and he again died of cancer the following year 
but he gave me uh, a symbol and he with the words for Christmas one of his symbols that I personally really liked he, was, he, was, he did a lot of jazz training as well as everything else and he gave me the symbol I said well you can't give me this, this is, he said well I don't need it I'm not going to need it am I we all know you want to play the drum so that's the start you want now get yourself a kit and get, get on with it so so when he died I had to um, his name's John Fisher fantastic drummer uh, and, and sadly missed by many people around various parts of the country. Um, so yeah, so I took up drums and I, and I loved it and played locally and uh, uh, and I've recorded on the drums. Um, you know, I'm playing drums on on some drums on the third Humans album, for example. Some of that drumming is me. Um, but I just love it. I suppose maybe because it's the newest thing that I do. Maybe I still have that youthful interest in it whereas the other two instruments i've done all my life you know, for years well I, i'm in, i'm involved with errol kennedy from imagination and, and this drumathon uh where we've done lots of drummers around the world from the big groups and the u2 and blondie and various other people have all been involved with this wonderful thing right. um and, and what they what they've been doing is they carried on they did this um started uh, all the way in april they then uh, errol realized he wanted to raise money for the nhs himself and so he started this drumathon and he got lots of these great drummers who would do 12 hour shifts drumming. Um, right. and, and basically they've been going on for many, many hours raising money for the NHS. And the next stage we're going to do is an auction on uh, July the 4th, where we're going to be auctioning things that's been donated. It's like Robin Gibbs, uh, blue glasses. We've got uh, some drumsticks from U2. We've got a Blondie signed uh, snare drum, all these sort of wonderful things. And there's a wonderful community about drummers. There's something about them. <laughs> That's that's absolutely true. I, I mean, honestly, this doesn't apply to everyone, but I I've no, I really have noticed, you know, guitarists. Yeah, we get on, we talk to each other, we we talk about equipment, and we're mates and and so on. And the same with bass players. Um, drummers are different, though. There, it's far less hidden competitiveness about it. It's much more open in support with drummers. Uh, that's that's what I've noticed. Um, of course, there are exceptions to that rule. Of course, there are, you know. And I think, you know, all instrumentalists, as we get older, we become more more giving. Um, but th there's definitely, you know, there's something far less cutthroat about the drumming community. I mean, for for example, a very small example is the fact that. In Seattle, um, certainly when we were there recording with the humans, you know, the, the two times we were there actually recording and the other times we were there, there, there was a drummer's club, lunch club. A lunch club? They, yeah. They, oh, it's Tuesday. Uh, we, we, well, ho hopefully they had a drum roll. That would be appropriate for a lunch club. That would be appropriate. Yeah. And they were, you know, drummers from all walks of life, some of the big names and some just local drummers. They, they would meet for lunch. Uh, Bill told me about it. And, uh, and I don't know, there's just something about that. You know, guitarists, we might meet and have a drink, but we won't say, let's have a guitarist lunch and phone up 10 of us and, and, and all get together and talk about guitars. Don't yeah. do that. Yeah. That does happen in the drum world. Oh, no, the, the drumming world, and I say, it's just been opened up to me as a result of the drumathon. I've been interviewing lots of the drummers. So we had Terl Brand, I don't know if you know him, but he's a, he was telling me about um, the competition to see how many beats you can do per minute. And there's a Guinness World Record. Have you ever worked out how I've many seen that, yeah. And it's nuts. And it's, uh, yes, it, you know, it's a thing, but it's not, if you like, real life drumming. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a specific thing, you know, which anybody could do, could learn how to do. Well, not anybody. It's got nothing to do with playing music. Oh no, no, God, no, I mean, just a noise. But but how did, how many do you reckon you could? Have you ever timed yourself? I, I have no idea. Right, so he's oh, no. he can do over a thousand beats in a minute, which which I find extraordinary. Yeah, no idea. I've no idea what I could do. <laughs> you know, I'm not the fastest. I'm not. You know, I'm, I've come late to drumming, so it's been ten years, if you like, thereabouts. I've come late to it. I've achieved, you know, a certain working standard on the drums uh, you know and I have an understanding of lots of types of music so I understand how the, how the drums work in lots of styles of music um, 
and I can hold my own and I'm a musician enough to, to play hopefully with taste in other words play less uh, where appropriate uh, I don't have the best technique in the world but I have some technique I, I just really love it and I, I enjoy playing the drums um, but it, you know for me it's it's a later thing so you know I kind of wish I'd started when I was 20 I'd be really good by now yeah. wouldn't I maybe yeah. maybe not you know who knows um, but, but yeah. it's something on what we said beforehand isn't it if you've got that element of fun and you love it it doesn't matter because it just no. doesn't feel like work then does it that's right and uh, I think that's important uh, and that's something as professionals we have to get over at some point in our lives we all start playing instruments because we like it you, you know you don't start playing the guitar because I think I'm gonna, I think I'm going to do that for a career you start playing because you like it and then maybe you start to have aspirations well actually perhaps I could do this for a career but at some point I think in everybody every musician's career there's been a point where they're kind of oh, do I really want you know it's become it's become a job now, I have to play this music it's my job and then the enjoyment can can leave I'm not saying it always does and it's a hurdle certainly I and most of the people I know have had to get over at some point in their career uh, it may last a week it may last a year I don't know um, but you have to get back to remembering why you why you learn an instrument in the first first place and it wasn't for it to be a career it's because you loved music and as soon as you get that mindset back then you're okay again but it when it is your job i think i think it'd be fair to say that almost every musician has had that moment where it's it's just been a job and like anybody in all their jobs there, there must be days you know i assume when the counselors think oh god i want another day in the office or whatever it is um and that's the same with us it's another day in the office, another game, you know, playing, playing this song again. But you have to remember why you did it and why. It's because you love music. Otherwise, if you didn't love music, you wouldn't consider doing it as a job, would you? So you have to get that memory back at some point. And I, I think you're right. And they always say that if you do a job that you love, you'll, you'll never do a day's work in your life. But the reality is, so there are days when you don't really want to go out and perform. Well, you know, you. You know, it's very few, uh, very few musicians get to play the music that they want to play every time that they play. We, you know, we, we, you know, I get to play music I, I want to play a lot, but I can't, you know, and I can't, but I couldn't say, for example, in Panto, that, you know, every tune, every song I arrange in the Panto, that I love it. Some of it I hate it, but it's it's right for that moment in the show, and it's an appropriate song, and it's the right style. And we need something modern at that point, or something old at that point. I can't say I love it all. I probably love about one song per per year, but you still have to do the job. Um, so so if most of us <clears throat> rank and file, if I can call us that, we play music that we're we're ordered to play. It's not music we would choose to play. Um, and that's most of the time we're doing that. But still, it's music. Still, it's playing an instrument that we, that we love to play. So, it, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of still not like work, even though actually sometimes you can feel like you might as well be a type, you, you're playing someone else's music and you might as well be a typist in the typing pool. You know, those moments do happen. You have to get over them. And it's important, as I say, to remember why you learned the instrument in the first place. It's because you loved music or you loved and or you loved the instrument. Not not for any other reason. Nobody decides when they're twelve. I think oh, when I, what are you gonna be when you leave school? Yeah, they might have, you know, oh, I think I'd be like to be a famous guitarist, but that's not why they took up the guitar. Yeah. It's not and you mentioned you, you play music that you would choose to play, and you've got such a, a wonderfully diverse, <laughs> the different types of music. What would you play if you just had the, the Chris Wong choice? It, do you know, I get I get asked that a lot, and it, my my stock answer is, you know, oh, I'd play jazz and jazz funk. Well, that's not really true. I would because at different moment, any given moment in the day. I might feel, you know, completely differently. 
you know, jazz and jazz funk is more cerebral, requires more brain input, and it's and it's technically more demanding. But you know what? There are times where I just want to thrash out on a really great rock riff that's really loud, that's completely in unison with the bass, and it's just really simple. But it just feels good to do it. There's, there's nothing hard about it, but it just feels good. Um, so for me, what music would I play, given the choice? That changes from day to day. Some days you, you're feeling more, more pensive, more thoughtful, and therefore you might think, oh, I don't want to work on my jazz chops. And other days you just want to go, Rah, and you just want to turn it up loud and play an ACDC riff. Um, so all, mu all music is valid from that point of view. What matters to me as a musician is the who I'm playing with. Am I playing with people who have the same commitment and the same yearning to, to be better? Can, is it, is, you know, are their standards as high as mine? Are we, are, and, are, and are they, in my own mind, my standards will never be high enough. So, you know, you want to strive to be better, be better, be better. If they've got that same mental attitude, then I'm happy to play with them. If if they if they if they think they're really great but they're really not, and they, then that's not enjoyable. So it's who you're playing with. Do the personalities click? Are you all striving for for perfection that we will never achieve? There's no such thing as a perfect performance. It can always be better. Uh, you know, I used to say when I was younger, it doesn't matter how good you get, you could always be faster. Now, speed isn't everything at all. Speed doesn't matter hardly at all. It's the intent of the music. But there is that answer. How good can you get? Well, you can always get faster if nothing else. You know? As you said, the drumming. And, and as you say, this is about sort of professionalism, things like that. And, uh, and, and that's why it's worked so well with Toyo, because you're always striving for something new and something different and something creative. What, what are your favourite things to play when you play with Toya? Uh, my favourite, well, my favourite song undoubtedly is a song called um, Little Tears of Love, which is off the Velvet Lion Shell um, EP. Um, so a later work, if you like, from Toya's canon. Um, and that tune is quirky in the harmony, it's quirky in, in the timing of the phrases and it's funky and has a real groove to it that, that uh, a different kind of groove to what to what you would normally hear with Toya. So I really enjoy that it's just different it's got dissonance in it which is really interesting as a sound and yet there's also a great riff in the middle of it um, and a really uplifting uh, middle eight and so on. So that's enjoyable, but also some of the new stuff from uh, uh, <clears throat> from Crimson Queen, like Hurricane, and that's now become one of the choices for as an opener. It's just joyous and and, and motors along, and and it's just it's just it's just great at the beginning to you know just hit that first chord. It rings for a whole bar. It's not that's not hard. Round. <laughs> But when the band kicks in like that, it's just the, the, the it's all about feeling and emotion, not about how clever it is. Uh, so, the, so some of the new stuff's really enjoyable. Super Sister, I really like that's got a great riff. You know. um, uh, yeah, probably a couple of songs from Crimson Queen and Velvet Lion Shell will always be my. I think that will always be my favourite. It's so different, not like anything else I've ever played with anyone. No, pr pretty phenomenal. And one of the things I mean, we do on this programme is, uh, I, as you say, everybody's the same. You know, if, if you prick me, do I not bleed? If you tickle me, do I not laugh? And we've been talking about a lot of mental challenges that people have and, and, uh, uh, and that sort of side and, and the mental health of the nation, which we always talk about, and the challenges where people are losing people in very difficult times. And we always say that physical health if you break your leg, people come and sign your cast, you'll talk about it, how do you break your leg and things like that. Mm. Start talking about the challenges that we have as humans. And there was a stigma attached to it for a very long time. And what I found really great about this program is that we've had the rich and famous, they've all come on and spoken about some really difficult personal issues um, because it's comforting for other people going through those things. Now you've had a lot of loss 
as you say, in the last, in a very short period of time, we lost John, we lost Chris, uh, very recently we lost Bill, within that sort of side, you lost your own father as well, within a very short period of time. Is there any advice you can give, any words of comfort you can give to other people going through similar situations? Um, I would say talk about it. Talk about it. Um, I remember, I mean, it can be simple, it can be something simple. Okay, so some friends of mine locally, brothers who I play in a band with, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, they, a couple of years ago, lost their father. Um, and I remember saying to one of the brothers, I can't, you know, I can't say anything to make it better. But all I can say is, having lost my father the year before, I know, I know. And that's all that to say. He said, I know you know, and that's all I need to know is that you know. Because, you, you know, we've all, you know, we've all had loss, especially as we get to our kind of age where we're losing parents and, 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 and people of our age who are, who are going. Um, you, you know, you can say, oh, do you want to talk about it? You know, is there anything I can help you with? And actually, for my, I know for my friend, um, just him knowing that I knew what he was feeling. We didn't, we didn't have to talk about it, but just that, so it can be something that simple. On the other hand, it can be something where if, if, you, if you've got pent up emotions, then you know, your real friends will always have time to listen to you. And I, and I knew that because, because my other friend had lost a family member when, when they were young. And he said the same things, and I'll never understand how he feels about it. Um, well, I know he, I know, he, I know he thinks about it every day. He lost a brother, and when I lost my father, he said, "I know, you know that I know," and that's and that's all I needed to all all I needed to know was that I wasn't wasn't you know I you don't know how I feel. We didn't I didn't have to explain how I felt to him. He just said, I know, and if you need to talk, I'm there. And I don't have to talk to, to this particular friend about it. I know I can. And that can be enough. But I would say, if the, you know, if you do need to talk, someone, one of your friends, will be there for you to listen. Otherwise, they're not your friends. And use that if you need it. It's not saying that everybody needs to talk about it. Um, some people just keep it to themselves. It's very personal, very private. But I think it's important that everybody knows that there is someone they can talk to about about these things. And and there are people who really do understand. It's easy to think, oh, you no, you don't understand how, how I feel. No, people do. People do. They may not talk about it, especially with guys. You know, we're supposed to be, you know, the typical guys, oh, we don't talk, show our emotions. Well, that's that's nonsense anyway, because we do. We do show our emotions. We may not show it to everybody, but we do show it. And it's fine. it's having those connections, I think. And um, those particular friends, the, the, the brothers who lost their father and the friend who lost a, a brother many years ago, there's something in our friendship where we don't have to say anything, but we, but we know. Each of us knows. And that, that can be enough. Something that simple can be enough. But talk about it. That's what I'd say. Don't keep it to yourself. Talk about it. And I think it is very comforting. It is. It's, it's the, the comfort because you feel so frustrated when people don't really know what to say. And I've had people on here who have been through, had a lot of people, loss during lockdown as well has been an added stress because you haven't had a chance to say goodbye. You haven't had a chance to have proper funerals and, and those sort of things. It's been really, really tricky. But, but I like that. Well, I think, you know, that, you know, that's, that's true. You know, there's been people, you know, you know, people have had family members in hospital, they know. And, and they feel awful, you know, that they haven't been allowed to go to the hospital. But you know what? And that, and, it, and that is terrible. And they can't bury them properly or whatever. That, of course, that is terrible. And, and no, nobody wants that to happen. But there are also people, remember, who, who have, who's, someone they've loved have died in an accident. They also haven't had a chance to say goodbye. And, and everything, when everything was fine and everything was hunky-dory and they were driving off, going somewhere nice, and there was an accident and they 
and they died. So this is not a new, it's not a new the, the, the not being able to say goodbye is not a new thing. It's just that the not being able to say goodbye at the moment has been forced upon us by circumstances rather than it being accidents. It's not a new thing. So there are plenty of people who haven't lost loved ones in the lockdown, but they've still lost people they haven't been able to say goodbye to. Uh, you know, I'm not in no way trying to lessen uh, how those people feel who have lost people in lockdown. Of course, it's, it's tragic, it's terrible. Uh, but again, you know, many people have experienced it. Talk about it. If, if you feel bad that you haven't been able to say goodbye, yeah, talk about it. I think you know, being open about these things is, is um, become, becoming more of the norm for society, where what, perhaps one, once upon a time it was all, you know, we, we don't talk about these things, especially, you know, blokes, we don't show it. No, it's, it's not like that. So, you know, go ahead, have that friend, talk to them. If they're a true friend, they'll never not listen. And I think you're you're right, Chris. When uh, people look back and they sort of say, "I wish I did this," or "I wish you did that," or "I wish I said that to that person," if you take that as a message now and actually make that phone call and build those bridges and say yeah. what you really want to say, then you won't have those regrets, will you? That's right. Yeah. Well, I said, so I think you will, because there'll always be something that you didn't say. But you know, do so. Do the best you can. Make, I, I agree. Make make contact now. I've made contact with loads of old friends during the lockdown. Just to say, um, uh, are you okay? Are you safe? Good. That's all I wanted to know. There's been a few people, lots of people have said that to me. And that's been, that's been the extent of it. But I just wanted them to know that I cared that they were okay. It doesn't mean to say we must hang out and, and live in each other's pockets once we're allowed to. No, I just want to know people I know that are okay. Um, it can be as simple as that. But yeah, reach out, say, you know, be open now because might, tomorrow might never happen. Um, so yeah, I'd agree, but there's still there'll always be things you wish you'd said that you didn't say. I, I, absolutely. Well, what's been your uh, over this a fantastic career and 25 years in Panto and starting so young? What, uh, what what's what's been your biggest regret? Um. Ooh. I wish I'd practiced more. I wish I'd taken up the drums sooner. I wish um, I been more open when I was younger uh, like I say there's a lot of skills I've learned in the last four or five years that, that you know before that I I'd almost you know revel in the fact that I was known for not smiling and standing in the corner and not being sociable but it, it became it became well I must be like that because I'm not known for being like that it's absolute nonsense so so why didn't I why wasn't I more open to meeting people and finding out about people and getting to know people and being interested in other people? Um, who knows what, where else my career might have gone if I'd been more uh, more sociable and, and things like that. Um, and so that's a relatively recent mindset that I've acquired to just be nice and talk to people. Um, I literally didn't used to. I literally would be in the party, at a, at, say a cast party, say at Panto. It'd be in the theatre bar, and I'd be in the corner, not talking to it. I'd have my, have my, my three friends around me, and it's like, let's go over there and talk to them. No, no, no. And I'd sit there all night, and almost, you know, revel in it. You know, well, that's, that was that was to my loss. That's my, you know, my loss, not going out and being sociable. Talk to people. I think that's my probably. If I regret anything, it's not. It's not being sociable, not being open. Uh, and as I say, that's it's a it's a relatively uh, new mindset for me. And uh, in terms of what's happening next, I mean, we're, we're coming out of lockdown. We found a plan. Uh, Theatre-wise, it's very tricky in the UK. We're not quite. We, sure. Yeah, we really don't know. Um, you know, theatres need a, a certain size audience, you know, a percentage audience to, to make things viable. Aside of the, the you know, the, the safety and the health issues and the isolation issues, if there aren't a certain percentage in the audience, then the show is not financially viable. Um, and if the show is not financially viable, uh, those companies, those production companies could go out of business. They could commit to doing a panto, for example. 
if it turns out that they it's going to be it's going to lose money they may not be in business next year um the, the guidance for theatres and so on at the moment well they really, you know they've issued these by this roadmap it doesn't make it doesn't mean anything you know we we will open when we can open we you know we're all hoping panzo happens of course we will have to just wait and see if it becomes viable or not we all want to do it uh, on the other hand we all want to be safe and we want audiences to be safe and there is you know it's not just a case of how many can you fit in to an auditorium and uh, will they be you know safe enough there are there'll be people who who maybe are not ready to go to a theater even if they're allowed to and they may not feel safe so there are lots of things uh, and of course there are you know, there may be venues well there are venues that have closed that have gone under already or you know months you know weeks and months ago went under they're not going to reopen they've gone um so yeah panto and theater in general to just don't know just don't know we just every day we we wait to see how things develop and and um, we we hope to be at the marlow at christmas for year number 26 um <clears throat> and if it goes ahead, it's Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, you have a, a lead, a lead uh, for Jack and the Beanstalk at the moment. I, 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 I may know, and I may not know. And if I didn't know, <laughs> I wouldn't announce it without until the company announced. It. Quite right too. Um, and then other gigs. Well, you know, pubs can reopen. Can they afford to pay? Have bands in pubs? Uh, no, they can't. They've not earned anything for three months. Uh, can you have a band in a pub where people are, are, are supposed to be, you know, uh, the band members are supposed to be six metres distant from each other? Well, that's nonsense in a pub. When the pubs doesn't need to be six metres from the band, I mean, well, in some pubs, pubs and, and two metres from each other, in some pubs, that would mean the band setting up illegally, shall we say, too, too close together, and the nearest punter being on the back wall of the pub, and then maybe a second punter there. That otherwise they were all too close, so it's all a bit of a nonsense. Yeah. Well, um, the nearest punter is on the street outside at six meters. Yeah, from the yeah. Pub. yeah, and the whole the whole floor of the pub will be the drummer over here and the bassist here and the singer over there and the guitarist over there, and that would be the whole pub being this distance far. So you know you, we have to play it by year, day by day by day, and thing. And um, there are you know plans for uh, to try some things out and, and see if they work. You know, I hope those go ahead, and I hope they work. If they don't, well, then I'm sure we'll all think of something else. Um, I want to be back playing um, uh, as soon as as soon as it's allowable. So, uh, who knows when that'll be? I don't know. But the the the, ent the entertainment industry will be very different. Um, there will be people who who are not in the business anymore because they've had to do something else. Uh, during this time, uh, or maybe they've gone completely under and cannot cannot do this anymore. Um, so things will be different, and um, we just have to wait and see. You know, I think you know most of us are very positive that we'll you know we're positive that we'll be back. Um, in the meantime, you know maybe I'll be uh, maybe at some point I'll, this summer I'll, I'll get a job picking fruit on the fruit farm. I don't know. Which fruit would you pick? What's your favourite fruit? My favourite fruit? Mm. Strawberries. I, I, I have to say, I used to love the strawberries. The thing about strawberry picking though is you eat your body weight in strawberries going round. <laughs> when, yeah. when, and, you know. and it's low down, there's a loss, it's back breaking. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, in Cam I was in Cambridge, we had the Chivers Farms nearby, and uh, that was a regular summer job for a lot of people. Uh, very good, fantastic. Well, finally, Chris, I, and I ask this of all my guests, is uh, Chris Wong, after a illustrious career, fantastic, varied career, 25 years in Panto, working with Toil, working with humans, and all the other stuff in between, the trio starting, 15 quid, five or each. How would you like to be remembered? Um, oh, I suppose professionally as someone who was professional so always uh, turned up to a job 
and treated it as worthy of time and investment and doing the best that you can. We used to say uh, in the early days of Panto, so uh, and bands that I played in before that, we whatever the gig was, we so we'd be about to go into the orchestra pit in Panto, and my friend Chris Moten was my drummer at that time. We'd go in. Stand by the door, get ready to go in, and we say, and we say to each other, right, Wembley, Wembley Arena, sixty-five thousand people, right? And it was, and it was a, a Thursday afternoon matinee of, of Jack and the Beanstalk or whatever it was. Wembley Arena, 60,000, 60, 80,000 people, right? You are, and then, we, and then we go, right? This because the gig is a gig is a gig. It doesn't matter if there's four people or four, forty thousand. You either you're either going to do the job right or you're going to but you're not going to care and it'd be and it'd be horrible so if you're going to i'd like to be remembered as someone who tried to always perform at my best chris wong it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for being my guest today um i look forward to seeing you out there when we're all allowed to go out very very soon let's hope so let's hope it's sooner than soon awesome. take care chris thanks a lot thanks very much bye so thank you very much to the fabulous Chris Wong for being my guest today. Um, it's been a real delight. Lots of fantastic topics covered from pantomime all the way to dealing with the serious stuff uh, about mental health and so on and so forth. A rich, rich career. Uh, if you ha are affected by any of the issues which you spoke about, write to me at enn at octopustv.com. The details are below. Do subscribe to Octopus, follow, share, stalk, whatever you like. But either way, do put your comments in the section below. Be in touch. Um, and if you've got any suggestions or any thoughts as to other guests or topics to cover, look forward to hearing from you. But in the meantime, I've been Andrew Eborn. You've been great. Thanks again to the wonderful Chris Wong. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.